All right, the fifth point that we want to ponder. Does prophecy foretell the Messiah's family tree? And the answer is absolutely yes. For one thing, God told Abraham, he was calling him from Mesopotamia. He said, through your descendants, the Messiah would come. And you find that in Genesis 12, verse 3. In you shall all the families of the earth be blessed through your descendants, that the Messiah would come through the Hebrew line. Now you realize a Jew and a Hebrew is different. Abraham had more children than just Isaac, and Isaac had more children than just Jacob. And Jacob had more children than just Judah. The word Jew kind of comes from the descendants of Judah principally, but we often use it to talk about Hebrews in general. But the Messiah would come through to the descendants of not only Abraham, but Isaac. You read in Genesis 26, verse 4, it says, I will give your descendants these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the world would be blessed. Because Jesus did not just come for Jews, did he? He came to save everybody, whosoever will. The promise is. He told the disciples, go to the ends of the earth. And then, not only did it come from Abraham through Isaac. See, Abraham also had Ishmael and several other children through Keturah. Isaac also had Esau. But he said the blessing would come through Jacob. And Jacob prophesied, you see the prophecy in Numbers 24, 17. A star will come out of Jacob, a scepter. A scepter is what a king holds. Will rise out of Israel. There would be this king, the king of kings that would come. By the way, that's the prophecy probably that the wise men in the east were reading when they came and followed the star, this star that said there was a new king that would come. And then when he was dying there in Genesis 49, Jacob, later called Israel, he prophesied that of his sons, and he had 12 sons and one daughter, the Messiah would then be coming specifically through which one? Judah, right? You all with me? You all knew that, didn't you? The Messiah would come through, of the 12 sons of Jacob, he would come through Judah. And he says there in Genesis 49, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, that means the king of peace, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So it would come through the tribe of Judah. But wait, we're not done yet. Get your credit card out. There's more. Not only from Judah, it keeps going further down. If you order now, we'll double your offer. They always say that, don't they? Through the descendants of David. There will come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David. And a branch will grow from his roots. So the Messiah would come from the household of David. And the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. Well, why does it say the Spirit of the Lord? The very word Messiah in the Old Testament means anointed. The word Christ, Christos, it's Greek for the anointed. You know, when they christen a ship, they splash a bottle of champagne or wine on it, and it's called a christening. An anointing means to shower something. Jesus was to be showered with the Holy Spirit of God. And they called him the anointed. That came through the descendants of David. Now you go to the New Testament, and you see, was it fulfilled? And you can read in Luke chapter 1, verse 26, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city in Galilee named Nazareth. Where did the angel go? I want you to catch that because there's going to be a problem here in a moment. To a virgin that was betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of where? House of David. The virgin's name was Mary. This all sounds like a Christmas sermon. You all know this story, right? But both Mary and Joseph were descendants from David. You find the genealogy of Mary going through her father back to Jesus in Luke, and the genealogy follows Joseph in Matthew. So either way, they were both descendants of David. And furthermore, it says that Jesus would come through not just the house of David, but the mother would be a virgin. Now that certainly is unique, right? You read that prophecy in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a son, and they'll call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jump to the New Testament. By the way, that's written 700 years before Jesus was born, foretold that the Messiah would be born of a virgin. Now you go to the New Testament, and you read in Matthew chapter 1, 18, it says that... Um, now the birth of Jesus was as follows, after his mother Mary was betrothed or engaged to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child. And of course we all know about the virgin birth of um, Mary. Oh gee, virgin birth of Jesus, but Mary was a virgin, yeah. What about where he would be born? Does the Bible talk? So we wouldn't have any doubts about who the savior of man would be. No doubts about when God became a man, who is it? It wasn't just one of many wise men or prophets through time. It was Jesus. The place of his birth is foretold in the book of Micah, about 600 years before Christ. He specifically said, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, 
unto you, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one who is to be the ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from old, even from everlasting. So another prophecy here. What does it tell us about Jesus? He's from everlasting. See, Christ didn't just appear when he was born from everlasting to everlasting. You know, Revelation, he's referred to as the, um, the eternal one. He's the I am there. He, he's the one who is the first and the last, the alpha and the omega. So Christ is from everlasting to everlasting. He was eternal. And it says that he'd be born in Bethlehem. Did that happen? Now, we got a problem. When the angel came to Mary, you heard me say a minute ago, where was she? Galilee in what city? Nazareth. I got a map up here on the screen now. You're going to see Nazareth as the crow flies is about 70 miles away. She's great with child. She's a long way from home. How are we going to get the Messiah born as he's supposed to be born in the city of David, Bethlehem? Well, this is one of the only times in history we need to thank a politician for doing a tax increase. <laughs> Caesar Augustus, Luke chapter 2, verse 1, issued a decree. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And they had to go register for the tax in their own city. And Joseph also went up uh, from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea there to be registered, uh, to be taxed and registered with his wife Mary or his uh, espoused wife being great with child. And of course while they are there we know what happened. And so it was while they were there the days were accomplished that she should be delivered and she brought forth her firstborn son and she laid him in a manger. And this is, of course, fulfilling that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. When the shepherds saw the angels, where were they? There were dwelling in those days outside Bethlehem shepherds watching their flocks. Now, you know, it's always been amazing to me. You know what Bethlehem means? Beth means house. Bethlehem, that means house of bread. And Jesus is the bread of life. And after he was born, he was placed in a manger. A manger is a trough for putting grain for the animals. So here you've got the bread of life born in the house of bread placed in a trough for bread. Jesus is the bread of life. Amen. And so she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for him in the inn. And again, the angels said, For unto you is born, they told the shepherds, in the city of David. Jesus would be a descendant of David, born in the town of David, and it was all foretold by the prophets, a Savior who is Christ the Anointed, the Lord. And when Christ was a baby, eight days old, they bring him to the temple to be named and circumcised, which was technically the first time he shed blood. When they called his name Jesus, he will save his people from their sins. The priest there in the temple, Simon, took him up in his arms and blessed them. And he said to his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and the rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will even pierce through your own soul. Foretelling, of course, the sufferings that Jesus would be going through. That the thoughts of many hearts might be revealed. So even at the very beginning, Mary was given a prophecy to let her know that uh, Jesus was coming not just as a lion, but he would first have to come as a lamb and suffer for the sins of the world. Well, then when Christ was uh, still a child, they're living in Bethlehem, Herod the king wanted to exterminate Jesus as a baby. You know, there's three times in the Bible when the devil made an effort to try to keep the Savior from coming. You can read about the devil thought maybe that a Savior was coming when the children of Israel were in Egypt. So he wanted all the baby boys to be exterminated. And yet Moses was miraculously spared. The Savior was spared. And then during the time of Queen Jezebel's daughter, Athaliah, she killed all of the seed of David. Again, the devil trying to keep the Messiah from coming. But miraculously, Joash was spared. And then, of course, during the time when Christ was a baby, Herod sent his soldiers to Bethlehem to kill all the baby boys once again to try to keep the Savior from coming. And Joseph was warned in a dream to go down to Egypt. And you read in the New Testament that after he received that warning, he said he arose and he took the young child and his mother by night and he departed for Egypt. Notice what Matthew says. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken through the, by the Lord through the prophet, saying, out of Egypt I have called my son. And here he's quoting Hosea. And so even the New Testament writers like Matthew, could often see how Jesus was a fulfillment of all these prophecies. They all combined and concentrated and focused in his life. You know, I get excited when I talk about this because there's just no question that Jesus is who he says he was. All right, and then you can say, and he came when he was a child. He moved back then after Egypt to Nazareth, and he was subject to his parents. That it might be fulfilled that was spoken of by the prophets, another prophecy, he will be called a Nazarene. Now, 
There they're talking about when uh, Samson's parents were told that this promised child would be a Nazarene. Several of the types in the Bible, like Samuel and Samson, had the vow of a Nazarite. Typically, Jesus is painted with long hair. And yet, you know, there's a scripture that says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. But the Nazarites were not supposed to cut their hair. And so some have wondered, did Jesus' parents have the vow of a Nazarite on him up until he was baptized? Because a person could have a Nazarite vow for a varying length of time. It wasn't necessarily a lifelong vow. Nazarites could not eat or drink anything from the vine. Jesus obviously drank grape juice. And so he may have just been a Nazarite up until his baptism or followed that vow. Uh, we're not sure, but he's typically painted with long hair, and that's one of the reasons for that. But that was foretold. And then he went down with his parents, and he came to Nazareth, and he was subject to them. You know, there's all these theories that say, well, you know, the reason Jesus was so brilliant is because from the time he was born, his parents then took him, and he studied under these wise gurus in India. Or he went to Egypt, and he studied there, and, and they've got all these theories about where Jesus got his great knowledge, because it says that he was uneducated in Jerusalem. What tells us that he learned the scriptures right there from his parents in home. He didn't go off and wasn't secretly taught by any, you know, kung fu experts off there somewhere and, and then come back and have this great enlightenment. He went to his parents. He lived a normal life for, 33, uh, for th the first 30 years until his baptism. 